Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host and constant reader, Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by the person whispering to me from the other side of a thick wall. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? It's going pretty good, Scott. I'm doing great. It's it's terrifying. (laughs) I didn't imagine it as scary when I read this in the story. I hope everyone's looking forward to the whole podcast being like this. I'm sure they are. I'm going to have to mess with your sound balancing. (laughs) As usual. This week on the show, we continue our time with Peter Straub and Stephen King's Black House, wrapping up Section 2, The Taking of Tyler Marshall, with chapters 11 through 14. The situation at Ed Eats goes from bad to very bad to uh, fine, I I guess. Yeah. As far as we know. Yeah. And then Jack meets Judy Marshall and commits to entering into a wild world of adventure once again. Matt, what did you think of this week's reading? Um, I, I enjoyed it very much. It seemed like not very much happened this week, which is fine. That happens sometimes where, it will, you know, even in a, even in a very good book, you'll you'll have a, a stretch of chapters that we select that, that are, are mainly doing table setting. And I think that table setting is an important part of storytelling and that is indeed i think a lot of what we're doing here you know we introduce um the thunder five Mm -hmm. we we uh i I think i think what we're doing is setting up some conflict with um our our photographer our 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 yellow journalism dude um and and then of course you know we have the the conversation with uh with uh judy which is also which is great actually I, i love that so um yeah overall overall very enjoyable i I think i'm ex- just briefly expressing like a, a sense of like I, i'm enjoying this book so much that it was painful for me to stop reading this week because i didn't feel like things moved forward very much sure yeah it, it it's the end of a section so it's i think you're right it's very much setting things up to move into the third part which is going to be basically the entire rest of the book there is a part four of this novel um it is we're, we're going to cover it in one week because it is just the end of the book. But I think the the majority of the rest of the novel is going to take place within our, our third part that we're approaching now. So this is very much, it feels like the midway point of the book. We've kind of put all our pieces on the board. We've kind of started to move them together. There's a lot of inklings in this, uh, this week's reading that shows like how, who is going to end up you know, teaming up, like wh- what our quartet is going to actually end up being. Um, they haven't quite all gathered yet, but the where the seeds have been planted of that, there's a lot of that going on. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And an interesting amount of um, nothing bad happening when we were really thought that bad stuff was going to happen. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I, I personally think some of these things are sort of being set up so that they can culminate later. Uh, yeah. Certainly a possibility for sure. We'll talk, but we'll about, talk about that. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> All right. uh, Before we get into this week's reading, though, we do have a couple of quick announcements. As we talked about last week, our book club was last Friday in which we talked about Dan Simmons' The Terror. That was a very fun one, but we also selected a new book in the middle of that meeting. What is that book going to be, Matt? That book is We Have Always Lived in the Castle. That's right. It is a Shirley Jackson novel. Um, And I think that's very fitting for this podcast because Stephen King is a big fan of Shirley Jackson. And he, he loves her work, especially the the Haunting of Hill House, which is uh, something he he borrowed heavily from in uh, in Salem's Lot. Yeah, so um, I think you know we're we're letting you know here at the start of the month, and we will be covering that. It, and it's a short book too. Um, and, yeah, and so, very short. But you know, the end of June is when we will talk about this. Actually, we we probably won't get around to it until honestly the 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 week after that. So you got plenty of time to read it. So go pick up We Have Always Lived in the Castle and come join us for our book club. It's so much fun. We have such a blast. Thank you to everyone who attends regularly, and we hope to see more of you there next month. All right, Matt, let's do it. Let's get into the chapters. Chapter 11, our first one of the week. And this chapter begins with a character that I've been waiting for for the last few weeks. We finally get to hang out with Beezer St. Pierre, one of the Thunder Five and the father of the fisherman's second victim, Amy. Um, We've kind of already been prepped a little bit on the Thunder Five, right? In our in our flyover chapter, we were given some basic information about who these bikers are and how they might not be quite your average bikers that you would expect to see. Um, Or at least they don't fall into every single biker stereotype. 
Yeah, that's what I, I was going to say. They're they're not entirely atypical as as bikers, um, mm-hmm. but they they are also not entirely stereotypical bikers. They yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about bikers as we go. Yeah, uh, I think it's interesting though. That this chapter is, you know, the beginning of the chapter at least is centering around Beezer, but it does not start with Beezer. It does not start from the point of view of Beezer. It starts with a, a man named Richie Bumstead, um, another link in the rumor chain spreading the news of Ed Eats all over town. And, and therefore, it is through Richie that we get to see Beezer and his gang for the first time. And and I think this is important because it's helping us define who these people are from an outside perspective. And what we get to see of Beezer here is that they are just this group of incredibly smart, incredibly large <laughs> uh, party animals, actually. I love this this quote here. He didn't have the stamina to put away two pitchers of Kingsland, play a decent game in pool, drink two more pitchers while talking about the influence of Sherwood Anderson and Gertrude Stein on the young Hemingway, get into some serious headbutting, put down another couple of pitchers, emerge clear-headed enough to go barrel assing through the countryside, pick up a couple of experimental Madison girls, smoke a lot of high-grade shit, and romp until dawn. You have to respect people who can do that and still hold down good jobs. So, I mean, that's a, a really fascinating picture of these guys, right? They are, they are stereotypical bikers in the party animal side of things right but they're also very intelligent and like obviously talking about gertrude stein and ernest hemingway like i I don't know what do you think of these guys from from this point of view right here i think it makes you curious to to figure out like uh, how these guys kind of linked up and formed their little posse um, you know, cause usually if you're going to form a, you know, a, a group in some kind of subculture, like if it's bikers in this particular instance, then, then the people who join the, the biker subculture usually have certain things in common. And those certain things usually aren't subtle understanding of, of the influence of Gertrude Stein on Hemingway. They may be other things, um, more related to motorcycles, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it kind of begs the question, well, how, how these guys find each other why like how do you end up in a situation where there's a bunch of bikers who um <laughs> who who are all mega intellectuals or sure or or maybe a bunch of mega intellectuals who decided to be bikers like i don't know it just it makes you curious yeah yeah it's a chicken and egg situation for sure like, yeah did they did they all meet in school and then say you know it'd be fun brewing beer and riding around on motorcycles and living our life that way that'd be fun and so yeah, they, you can, can imagine one of them got Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, and then they all <laughs> got motorcycles, and they all became stereotypical bikers on purpose. Could be, could be, yeah. So Beezer hears the news about Ed's eats and dogs, tells his wife, who he calls Bear Girl, that he's got to go, summoning his four compadres via street telephone, which turns out is just <laughs> yelling very loudly. Uh, I love Beezer. I don't know if I've said that enough already. Uh-huh. Um, so they hop on their bikes and head out that way. By the way, we learned that Bear Girl's real name is uh, Susan Osgood. So, I mean, kind of worried about her now, huh? Uh huh. Yeah, all, all kinds of signs, importance. Um, the the Susan curse. The Susan curse, and also I don't know something to do with the Bear Beam Guardian or something. I don't know. Sure, I'll, I didn't think about that, but no, yeah. I like that. I like that. Uh, So we don't know much about the other members of the bike gang quite yet, but we get to see their names at least. And their names are Matt, Mouse, Sonny, Doc, and Kaiser. Um, So that's, (laughs) I mean, this is so fun, right? Like, Uh what do you do with that? I mean, they're, they're vintage King names. This is, this is a, a section of reading that is filled with like just beautiful Stephen King character names. And I, I love these guys. You haven't gotten to know them very much yet. Uh, it knows, it's not spoilers to say you will get to know them a little bit more throughout the rest of this book. But uh, man, they're so fun. Yeah, they are very fun. And, you know, I think it's really important that they be fun because like, got to admit, when we got to this section, part of me was like, you know, damn it, I don't want to break away from Jack and, and the other small handful of characters that we've been with for basically half of the book thus far. And then have to, you know, get introduced to a whole new cast list but of course, these authors, they know that if they're going to need to introduce you to more characters at this point in the story, then they'd better make it fun and, and engaging and make you glad yeah. that you're introduced to, to new characters instead of instead of feeling annoyed that you're being distracted. Uh, so, so you know, it worked perfectly, you know, within, you know, seconds of, of me uh, being introduced to, to these new characters. I was I was on board and I was like more curious to find out what's going on with them, you know. Yeah, that's such a great point because I'm the season season four of Stranger Things came out 
over the weekend, and I've only watched the first episode. Um, but that's a show that I've had very mixed feelings on based on the seasons, um, and I was pretty excited to start this one. And that's a show with a ton of characters already, and they've added new characters every season. And I've again, I've only watched the first episode, but they're clearly going to be adding more new characters. And part of me was just like, I don't know if I want I want more people in this thing. Although I will say that like the character that they added is an interesting person. I like him. So I, I think it is a fine line to walk when you're like kind of going to just take your small group of characters and expand that out in a way that makes your story all the more complicated. Yeah, exactly. And I think they nailed it here. I think it does help that we've kind of been told by the story from the very first page that that these guys were going to be important to it in some way. I think you're right because we have it, we've been curious to find out what is the deal with the Thunder Five, you know, the, the, this mysterious group of intellectual bikers. And so part of that, I agree, is us finally getting our curiosity satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I love this moment, Matt. And so I, God, I, I need to talk about this so much because I find the character of Beezer so fascinating. But but Beezer is driving past all the cars heading out to uh, to Ed's um, and he comes up with this idea in this moment that the best thing he can do right, right here is to cooperate with the police and help them deal with the crowds. Um, and in exchange, he can negotiate like an exchange of information so he can be be held, held abreast of what is going on in the investigation. But what this thought process does is distract him from what he normally does while riding his motorcycle on the road, which is like scare the shit out of drivers <laughs> randomly. Uh -huh. Like you just look at people that aren't driving well or people that are driving shitty cars. Like what he does is quote, strike unreasonable terror into the beaters driver by looking them in the eye and snarling. I make Kings Linnell the best beard in the beer in the world. You dimwit cur. He has done this to two drivers this morning, and neither one let them down. The people who earn this treatment by either lousy driving or the possession of a truly ugly vehicle imagine he is threatening them with some grotesque form of sexual assault, and they freeze like rabbits. They stiffen right up. Jolly good fun, as the citizens of Emerald City sang in The Wizard of Oz. What a fascinating <sighs> choice to layer on top of this character. A guy that is like, you know, a big dude, big, strong, party animal, but extremely smart extreme like and, and and as it seems as we'll see things play out in this chapter kind of on the side of good wanting to help wanting to solve the murders and then you just layer this this personality quirk on top of him and it's just like wow what a thing yeah he's he's uh not easy to put into a box i i almost feel like that's what they're going for with this character is you don't really know what to do with him you you feel tempted to put him into one box or the other um, and, and maybe he's intentionally resisting that. Like maybe that's part of the biker thing is this is an intellectual who has decided using his intellect that he doesn't want to be an ivory tower, disconnected brain in a jar human being. He wants to be uh, a wild Viking. And, and so he intentionally becomes a biker, but the kind of biker who calls people a dimwit cur, um, which, you know. <laughs> probably not a common biker insult i don't know yeah um i'm always I'm, I'm kind of interested to see where this book goes with the phenomenon of bikers because i happen to know a lot of bikers and and i've, I've always been interested in like the sociology of of bikers because fundamentally to 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 be a biker you sort of just need to have a motorcycle but kind of needs to be the right kind of motorcycle right and then also well, you kind of need to dress properly. Yeah, there's a uniform for sure. There's a uniform. And, and and then you realize like, well, so when we say biker, we mean a subculture, actually. We don't just mean a person who rides motorcycles. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting. It seems to be a, like a really strong attractor where people will start out just liking motorcycles and then suddenly they're getting tattoos and wearing leather and like like going into going into the whole subculture thing. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. This is kind of how subcultures work in general. It's just, it's, I've observed this happen in my life. And so it's just an interesting example for me because it doesn't really hold any appeal for me personally. I mean, the sure. idea of riding a motorcycle seems kind of cool, but like not enough to actually make me do it. So <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a, yeah. it's a fun and long story short, I'm interested to see like how, how kind of deep we go into the, uh, into the, into the rabbit hole of, of these characters and kind of who they are and why they're doing what they're doing. 
Yeah. And I mean, I think with other subcultures, like the uniform itself, like originated out of, um, you know, function, right? The mm-hmm. idea of, of wearing leather was to protect yourself in case mm-hmm. you needed to put the bike down, you know, right. um, right. And, and then it's expanded from there. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And it's fascinating to kind of wonder why in this book in particular, why did we have these characters be belong to the subculture? What is that saying? What are we doing with that? And I think it's too early to get answers to those questions yet. But uh, still, still a fascinating, fascinating idea. Yeah, yeah. Because he's this contradiction, you know, he's this he's he's big boisterous loud but smart um obviously very caring too like he loves his daughter very much like it, th- this opening scene has him wiping the tears he's crying into his beard um so like i don't know it, it's he's he's a fully fleshed out and formed character who who uh, holds two stereotypes while also defying them all at the same time yeah um so th- th- don't answer if, if the answer would be a, uh, some kind of spoiler but like I get the impression that he's like the leader of the posse. Um, mm-hmm. Is that true or is it just like, well, he's the one whose daughter got murdered. So he is sort of he's on this vendetta and the others are helping him. And that's the dynamic for the moment. I think that's a safe assumption that okay. he is. He is the leader of the group for sure. OK. OK. Yeah. All right. So moving on from Beezer, we move over to the red piece of shit that Beezer failed to scare. Um belongs to our our good friend matt our good friend and local reporter wendell green who uh we also finally see making an active appearance in the story this is another character that was set up for us early on in the story that we haven't actually hung out with very much um and, and once again just king and straub's the the ability to initially characterize someone you hadn't seen before but already kind of know continues to delight me because we have this line here his little car may not have been ugly to begin with, but by now it is so disfigured by multiple dents and scrapes that it resembles a rolling sneer. And Green drives with an unyielding arrogance he thinks of as dash. He zooms through yellow lights, changes lanes recklessly, and tailgates as a means of intimidation. Of course, he blasts his horn at the slightest prov- provocation. Wendell is a menace. The way he handles his car perfectly expresses his character, being inconsiderate, thoughtless, and riddled with grandiosity. <laughs> Uh, that's great i love riddled with grandiosity that yeah. that really jumped out to me in the moment it's wonderful and it, it kind of does our job for us right to say like to draw a clear line between hey look his car is a metaphor for who he is as a person look at this car and you will understand everything you need to about wendell green yeah and it's no surprise that we're focusing on this because i, I think he's going to become a more central character as we move along interesting okay we'll circle back around to that i think okay Uh, So we see immediately that Wendell Green doesn't actually give a shit about the good people of French Landing at all or the or the wanting to save wanting to save children or catch the fishermen or any of that stuff. All he cares about here, it seems, is his career and how this specific event will aid it. He's he's got Pulitzer Prize echoing in his head as he dictates his story via his his uh, cassette recorder. I think this is uh, he comes off as a prick here, like for sure. But like the thing, the the the, dis, the most disgusting thoughts of Wendell Green don't actually happen until later in the chapter. That is, we'll get to it in a minute. But planning on taking a picture of the corpse and selling it to a tabloid. But I think I don't know. I, my I I don't know if I'm mixing the things I knew about him from other places in the book. But I think very early on we understand that the police's hatred of this guy is not just. Oh, here's the journalist coming in to get in the way of us doing our jobs, right? I think Wendell just kind of sucks, and the book wants you to know he just kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, he is he is a self centered little shit. <laughs> um, you know, here and and like you kind of indicated later, we'll see. Like he his inner life, his inner monologue is so bereft of any kind of common human concern for others or, or, or humanity at all that like, I, I just, he's the kind of guy who I, I expect we're setting him up to be responsible for some truly horrible shit later in the story. Hmm. Like, like this is just the warm up. This is just us getting, getting a sense of him and realizing like, oh, okay, this is a bad, this is a bad guy. And, and he's capable, he's probably capable of much worse than what he's done thus far. If he thinks that he can gain an advantage by it. Okay. 
Okay. Do you think that this is a larger comment by these two authors on journalists or journalism in general? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't recall any other instances of journalists as a group being slammed by King. So I don't know. I, I guess I'd be mildly surprised to learn that Stephen King hates journalists, <laughs> but maybe there's other books where he does that. Um, yeah, I, I, I bring this up because I don't think it is. And I think there's a tendency in things like this when you see a depiction of a journalist in a story or a picture of, you know, let's say a film critic in a story or movie, the tendency is for people to look at that and say, oh, well, clearly these people don't think much of journalists or film critics or X group of people. And I think that's a dangerous thing to do because like, obviously what specifically Stephen and, and Peter have a problem with here is shitty muckraker, awful journalists that have no scruples and are completely self-absorbed. Like, I think there's a tendency in fiction sometimes to take one example and and make it mean a larger group, which I mean, sometimes that sometimes storytelling can do that, right? Sometimes you can have a character that is supposed to represent a larger group and you can explore that larger group through interactions with that character. But I don't think just because you can do that doesn't mean that it's always doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly got the vibe that we were just saying that Wendell is a a horrible uh, person actually. And mm -hmm. this is not about all journalists. Sure. Sure. But also Matt Wendell is a coward because as Beezer St. Pierre drives by, he loses his shit. We see here his stomach clenches and sweat bursts from every pore in his broad, ruddy face. His left hand trembles on the wheel. His right shakes the cassette recorder like a castanet. Wendell lifts his foot from the accelerator and slides down on the car seat, turning his head as far from the right as he dares. He, his basic desire is a cure up, curl up in the well beneath the dashboard and pretend to be a fetus. <laughs> So uh, we, we understand that actually Beezer has threatened Wendell in the past because Wendell asked him what his thoughts on the murder of his daughter are and, and Beezer kind of put hands to him. Um, so we understand where this fear is coming from. But I, I want to talk about this cowardice here a bit because I think I think if you look at it, it is a trend amongst King's bad guy characters. Um, Wendell Green is a bad guy character in Stephen King stories, you know, like, like, uh, similar to the way I think a lot of the Salem's Lot people were bad guy characters. That is, they're not people like possessed by evil, but they're just selfish and bad and shitty to other people. Um, at least, at least we don't think that Wendell Green is like possessed by some larger malevolent force. It, it's possible the Crimson King's hanging out inside there, but I don't think so, right? No, I mean, he probably just has a bad twinner, but you know. <laughs> Um, but I do think it's yeah. interesting that a common trend of these type of characters, these type of mundane badness characters is on top of doing terrible things, a kind of cowardice. I mean, the, you see here, Wendell is like the perfect behind the wheel warrior where he like tailgates to teach people lessons and uses his horn freely. But when it comes to any actual kind of conflict, he's a complete coward. Yeah, I agree. I mean. I, I agree that fear is very often the source of, of the evil in so many of King's characters, you know, it, it's uh, out of fear. They do things they think are necessary to protect mm -hmm. themselves. And, um, I, I think, I think that this particular guy, he's in a position where his fear can do a lot more damage because his is one of the main voices that the whole town is listening to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think if we are going to make a comment on journalism in general, then we could, you know, the, the, on the meta level that that uh, journalism can definitely be very destructive when it's being used to, you know, scare the shit out of people on purpose instead of inform them. And, and I think, you know, he, he uh, thinks nothing of, you know, actually fomenting a mob uh, if it if it sells more papers and, you know, um, so, so I think, I think he's particularly dangerous due to his combination of being a coward and having a pulpit. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Cool. All right. So we will, we will see where that goes with Wendell, but where we're going with Wendell right now is towards Ed's as the traffic gets worse and worse. Finally, he sees the two officers that we know are waiting there. Officer Cheetah and Pam, um, who by the way should have like their own Netflix show. I can just see it like, cheetah and pam yeah 
officers at law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that'd that be the like the subtitle. Officers at law. <laughs> officers at law, which doesn't make any sense. I don't know why I went with attorneys at law and then realized, oh, wait, they're cops, not lawyers. I, I want it to be officers at law because then it can be like a comedy. You know? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Cheetah and Pam. Officers at law. Yeah, there you go. Come on, Netflix. Make it happen. Yeah. Um, so these two officers are trying to stop everyone from coming more, more and more cars are coming. The tension is getting increasingly higher. And, and then this weird thing happens where we witness through the eyes of Wendell green, that thunder five, instead of demanding to be let in, turn around and head back the way they came. Wendell, of course, being the unfortunately smart and clever guy he is realizes that they must know of a back road and that they're definitely going to take it. And so, uh, he follows them. Yeah, it's funny because at first we're like, oh, no, the the back road. And then we're like, aha, but the bikers are actually going to help. So the back road's not going to be a problem for the cops. And then Wendell figures out about the back road. And then you're like, oh, no, the back road. Um, so it's just that there's a fun, um, I don't know, it, 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 it like tricks you twice about how concerned you should be about the back road. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Um, so he turns off where they do and and then gets out of his car and starts like crawling and creeping um the last mile or so on foot so as not be discovered and i think this is where the book allows us to really see the breadth of wendell's shittiness because we see here the photograph wendell wants most however and for the sake of which he is prepared to bribe every cop county functionary state official or innocent bystander capable of holding out his hand is a good clean dramatic picture of irma frenow's naked corpse preferably one that leaves no doubt about the fisherman's depredations, whatever they were. Two would be ideal, one of her face for poignancy, the other a full body shot for the perverts, but he will settle for the body shot if he has to. An image like that would go around the world, generating millions as it went. The National Enquirer alone would fork over, what, 200,000? Three? For a photograph of poor little Irma sprawled out in death. Mutation, mutilations clearly visible. Talk about your gold mines. Talk about your big kahunas. So did you ever watch the movie Nightcrawler, Matt? Because this reminds yeah. me exactly of that psychopathic character from Nightcrawler. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love Nightcrawler. It's a fantastic movie. We should, talk, we should do a doof cast on that. We should. Um, But like, yeah. So let's... Wendell definitely sucks. We've talked about how Wendell sucks. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the idea of like, is what he's thinking here actually true? Or is this more a reflection of his depraved psyche? Like... Specifically, will the National Enquirer really pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for graphic crime scene photos? Like, like, does the National Enquirer publish graphic crime scene photos or anything of that nature? I, I honestly don't know. I, I think I, I don't know if I'm meant to be confused about this or if. So I think there's an interesting thing the book is doing here, where where I'm sitting here being like, people don't actually want to see that shit. And and then the book kind of says, eh, some do, because, you know, pretty shortly after this, we see that like, m you know, probably dozens, maybe hundreds of rubberneckers from all over the, the local area are, are showing up to try to, you know, see the body or, or see what's going on. So, so in, in many ways, actually, the book is trying to make this case that like, it's not yeah Wendell sucks but it's not just Wendell that sucks there there are actually people out there who want to see that that horrifying photo like in you know people in general are are kind of fucked up actually um yeah I mean I don't know if the National Enquirer itself would actually purchase these photos I, I don't I don't read the National Enquirer I don't know what kind of things they typically post I think it's a very useful grab because most people know a, what the National Enquirer is, and B, have some sort of negative connotation associated with it because they're kind of the rag mag that will publish anything or talk mm -hmm. about anything or just lie like blatantly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's functional in that regard. But yeah, no, I think I think that's a very optimistic viewpoint of humanity you have there, Matt. And I think that uh, I think that they they people would definitely pay money to see these pictures for sure. Yeah, I guess um, I guess the book is, regardless of whether that's like factually true, the book is certainly laying it out and saying like, like I guess it's giving us these cop characters, and the cops are like, why? What is wrong with these people? Why are they so interested in this? And then, and then the book is just showing like, well, they're here, you know, they are interested in this, 
and um for all sorts of reasons right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll, we'll talk yeah. more about them in a minute i think sure sure so while walking down the road a dumpy old truck comes up filled with some of just the most quality people in french landing uh, we have four individuals here named teddy runkelman freddie socknesum toots billinger and doodles sanger um I told you we were going to be talking about names a lot this week, Matt, because <laughs> these names, I mean, Jesus, like the thing is, King and Straub do not take a lot of time to actually characterize these people. I think the one we get the most characterization from is Doodles, and I think that is literally just because uh, Wendell, our point of view character right now, hooked up with her at some point, and so he knows her a little bit, but yeah. you don't almost don't need the characterization because their names are doing such work here yeah yeah absolutely um well their names do a lot and then like i still manage to dislike them all pretty intensely oh um, yeah despite the fact that they don't do or say much they just they're just kind of like dumb and 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 you know easily swayed into doing this obviously bad thing and uh and you know yeah i just i i'm surprised at how much i hate them given that they're actually kind of <laughs> kind of just goofy you know yeah they're, they're almost comic they're, they're almost just comic relief but also like i hope they die so yeah but even it's a scene in which like there shouldn't be comic relief yeah. you know like like yeah. this is the the like it's very easy to forget because the the body is such non a non-focus of this week's reading because we've already seen the body in fact like there's no part of this entire scene where our characters like examine the body and talk about that like we don't do any of that here Um, and, and so like, it's easy to forget that how, how incredibly inappropriate this whole, this whole situation is that there's a body of a child lying in a building that has been murdered and mutilated. And like all people are doing is behaving absurdly and ridiculously. And, and I think they are the greatest example of it. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's like an, it's an indignity layered on top of the horror of what's already happening. I, Mm -hmm. I think you're right. So Wendell sees these people, and of course, because he is a piece of shit, he has an idea to use these clowns uh, to get what he wants. That is uh, a distraction to allow him to sneak into the building and take the pictures he needs. So he pays them off in order to uh, to to run around like idiots screaming. Yep. And they certainly do a good job of it. (laughs) They certainly do. And then we we shift right on into chapter 12, a very short chapter that's only a few pages long here, stuffed in between these two longer chapters. Um, We begin this chapter still with Wendell as he sneaks up and witnesses Jack Sawyer walk out of Ed's Eats after what we know is is planting evidence, planting the severed foot. Um, So I think this is really great because this is kind of our worst nightmare come true, right? We talked about this last week, this idea that Jack was about to do something that is, you know, functionally for the investigation and for the good of the missing child and for the good of everyone makes sense. Mm -hmm. Leaving the foot there so he doesn't get pinned as a suspect of this whole thing and therefore is is taken off the board and then cannot investigate. So what he's doing is, is overall good, but it is still against the law he's he's doing bad to do do good right and the worst character in the world to see him to witness him do this is wendell but i think importantly wendell doesn't actually witness him do it right he sees him with the ball cap and the empty plastic bag and he makes a supposition it just happens to be a correct one right yeah i mean i i think not only that but then even the evidence that he's able to capture here with the photos is is destroyed promptly uh yes. we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute definitely but yeah. but I, I mean my feeling about all of this is you is he walks away from this encounter uh not having anything solid with which to crucify jack sawyer mm-hmm. but he has a big van a big vendetta now um he's super pissed at everybody i think jack sawyer Maybe not centrally, but but he he knows that he can get Jack Sawyer, and so now he's going to be motivated and maybe you know try to follow him around and and uh, screw him over. So yeah, he is. I think we've introduced Wendell as as a thorn in Jack's side, even though he didn't get the the kill shot right here. Sure, no, I like that. I like that. So Wendell celebrates in the moment. He's so happy that he's got this information, and uh, and then he sees Henry sitting around 
doing nothing. And he says, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. And so he takes a picture of Henry, who, of course, immediately hears the click of the camera and then says, hey, I know you're out there, person. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Which Uh is another thing that doesn't really pay off either. This is such a fascinating collection of chapters. Right. I mean, I think it helps. It helps determine that there there is indeed somebody taking pictures. What's funny to me, though, is like. It, it, this is more of of henry being supernatural because you yeah. know just because he heard a shutter click if i hear a shutter click that doesn't mean that i know that somebody took my picture that just means i know that a picture was taken nearby sure but henry knows that that, that somebody <laughs> was pointing the camera at him and then you know immediately triangulates it and and uh, yeah. and, and he's right you know he's right of course yeah he's amazing and yeah. i i think you're right I, I do I do want to circle back around to the idea that this doesn't matter though, because it doesn't. Like it, it in this moment, the first time you read this, I think the thing you're automatically thinking is, ah, nobody noticed Wendell Green there, but Henry heard him and therefore Henry noticed him. And so the reason Wendell gets caught in this moment is because Henry, with his super powered hearing, is able to pinpoint him when no one else can. But that's not the way the scene plays out, right? The way the scene plays out is uh, Beezer is standing there dealing with these distracted peoples and he sees them kind of glance over into a, a certain direction because they're waiting for orders. And when he follows their glances, he sees Wendell standing there, grabs Wendell's camera, destroys the, the film. We'll get to that part later. But this has nothing to do with Henry's, like, place in this whole thing so it's another moment in this this thing that lays out where you feel like we're setting things up to do certain things you feel like we're setting up wendell to catch jack in the act you feel like we're setting setting up henry to catch wendell in the act and yet neither of those things actually play off in any kind of real way in the scene itself yeah you're right i don't have a lot, i totally agree um and it's interesting and i don't know that i understand why and don't have much more to say it I, I do think that the only way that I can move the ball forward is to say like, well, okay, what is Wendell going to do after this? And sure, sure. That will help us understand. Yeah. And but by the way, I'm not saying, oh, this is bad writing because what are these things? No, I'm, I, I'm just saying it's curious. It's curious the way this, this whole sequence plays out because I think it plays out in a way that's different from the way you probably would expect it to have played out. Um, mm-hmm. Because like things just seem to be setting up to, to to dominoes are kind of set up to fall in a certain way and then like it's kind of like you pull one of the dominoes out at the last minute and so it just stops and you're just like huh okay interesting yeah yeah you're right i I guess it it leaves us with a with a sense of of crafted like tension because the thing we were worried about didn't happen but then we don't really know what to do with the tension maybe i don't know that's an interesting thought though i like your dominoes (laughs) dominoes <laughs> slash jenga tower sort of visualization oh jenga tower would have been better yeah well i you said dominoes but i pictured a jenga tower and then i almost yeah <laughs> we're, we're all good all right uh so we move on to chapter 13 our final one dealing with the mess that eds eats uh and this chapter is a bit weird as well matt it's a bit all over the place king and straub structure this chapter and frankly the also the two before it in in an interesting way we're we're cutting between characters but we're also cutting between timelines because we're kind of moving back and forth in time witnessing several scenes um sometimes witnessing the exact same moment from entirely different perspectives and and frankly it's a bit confusing it's a bit disorienting i think but when you think about it i do think that's the point I think that this is a chapter in which things are boiling over. Chaos is happening. There are hundreds of people screaming to be let in. Suddenly there are four idiots running around screaming at the crime scene itself. I think the choice to build the structure of the chapter this way was to make you feel as confused and disoriented as all our characters are, as as all the stuff is breaking down the way it is. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, I I was confused. Um, I... This is probably the, one of the few times out of any of these King books that we've covered where I genuinely was like, wait, what? Oh, that's th- this is before that. And wait, I, <laughs> wait, I thought that guy was over there, you know, yeah. like just like actually being. And then, you know, it kind of snaps together eventually. So it's not like you walk away. Like I don't it's not like in this conversation I'm going to be like, OK, Scott, 
I need you to lay it all out for me. What the fuck happened here? It's like, no, I, I got it in the end. It's just, it, it, there were a few moments in there where it was disorienting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think you're right. It does come together. I think once you get to the end of it, you realize that what they were doing is they were basically going back in time to the beginning of the event. And then in order showing what each character experienced all the way up until the point where our four idiots like break out of the woods and start acting like idiots. We we just see, we see the events of everything here play out up until that moment. And then that moment is kind of when everything converges mm-hmm. um, to, to the fi- the finale, the finale of the scene. And, oh, and it works. It works. Yeah. I wonder if we're setting up a, a, an expect, you know, a pattern of, um, of expectation of like, we're going to, we're going to do subsequent scenes in a similar fashion where we have like parallel tracks where we, we jump back, you know, we, we jump between them, but in this sort of nonlinear fashion. Yeah. That's a fun thought. We, we will see. We will see. So the chapter starts with uh, Cheetah and Pam, uh, officers at law, trademark, uh, dealing with the crowds. And this is this is we've moved, by the way, all the way back to when the Thunder Five originally are arriving on the scene now. Um, so King kind of and, and Straub, I should mention Straub here. I always forget that. I'm so used to saying so King does this, but Peter Straub is here, too. So King and Straub um, like are, are dealing with the, the concept of small town people again here. Right. Um, and basically in this moment, we're getting a lot of great examples of just the quality folk of French landing and the surrounding areas. Right. And I think this, this one in particular is really interesting to me because there's a husband and wife elderly couple here. And what they say to them is young man, apparently you're, you are the only person in this County who does not understand that history is happening us all around us. Imagine, I feel like we have the right to a keepsake, um, which is just a horrifying word to say in this moment right a keepsake yeah. of, of the child murder what do you mean <laughs> and, and i don't like i don't think the point here uh, is that oh all of these people are all horrible monsters right like i don't think that i think it's more of a larger commentary on the state of humanity that we we kind of when we are faced with the kind of evil that is albert fish and then of course this version of the fisherman the only thing we know what to do with that is to like look at it right we're just like and this is why i think people would absolutely buy those pictures matt or 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 a place would buy those pictures to publish them because they know people would want to look at them i think the innate curiosity of people when it comes to murder and dismemberment and 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 the all these horrible things is not necessarily like across the board like titillation i think it's mostly just i don't understand how it could be possible that a person would do that thing. And so my way of dealing with it is just, I have to see it because that's the only way I'll actually believe it. Uh huh. That's an interesting thought. I mean, I, I, I sort of agree. I think also one thing that, that this part of the book is doing as we're seeing all these townspeople drive up is that we're seeing that there are sort of a variety of, of reasons, you know, Mm-hmm. That, that these people th- these specific people have shown up like like th- that specific elderly couple they feel like this is a historical event and they want a, a memento mm-hmm. which is which is a weird kind of disconnection from the actual horror of what's happening yeah but but sort of understandable if you kind of squint um and but then the, you know the text also talks about like i forget the exact wording but it's like there's like a really beautiful young woman who like chills our our cop characters to the bone because of how like off she is and it's like well she's probably here for a totally different reason sure th- than than this elderly couple and and so all of this i think adds up to saying like you know okay so there's probably thousands and thousands of people that live in this region and only maybe dozens or low hundreds or whatever have shown up to this location and, and that tells us like this is sort of a cross section of like all of the all of the ways in which it's possible to be a weirdo who's interested in looking at <laughs> a dead body. Um, and it's also telling us that there's a lot of general latent interest in this horrible event and, and only only a fraction of people are actually going to come out, even though probably a, lo- a far larger number are, are very upset and, and, and interested by all of this. Um, yeah. And I mean, some people are definitely just there to like show how pissed off they are at the police for not solving mm-hmm. this thing yet. You know, they're just there to protest. But like, I, I just find like crowds gather around things in very interesting ways. And and you're right. Like, I think a crowd gathers 
in an, in an organic way in which each person comes to the crowd with their own specific reasons. But it is interesting the way that then they then from that point on kind of meld into one mass of we want this or, you know, like, I don't know. It, it's really interesting the way this this happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. They do. There does seem to be a mob psyche thing that, that kind of crops up as they go. Like there's the the, the hell no, we won't go chant. Yeah, which which is just I even love, more funny because it's I like, love the comment because the guy's like, wasn't that about Vietnam? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can totally imagine people doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's really interesting because from here we kind of things go from bad to worse, right? Because the Thunder Five show up, which is a good thing. Um, th- this time they're coming from behind the cops. We know it's because they came from the back road. But we also learn that they've kind of negotiated with Dale um, to to help out here for some more information. And so they're here to help out. Um, and we actually uh, a note of the structure, the weird structure. Again, we actually saw that conversation between Dale and Beezer happen in last week's chapter. Now we're kind of seeing the result of that play out here. And and it's unfortunately right when they get here that things start to get really bad. You're right. They start chanting. Um, they've got signs suddenly. Um, suddenly, Doc, one of the Thunder Five, is like yanking a reverend out of his car window for some reason and we're not we're still like i I read and reread that section multiple times and the book still does not draw a clear reason for why doc decided to do that (laughs) it's just the guy was being mean to him i guess or he just decided that the guy was being mean to him yeah i mean i thought in that particular context it was just he he was like dialed to 11 and so yeah somebody not immediately capitulating was like I'm going to fuck you up. And then he realized, right, right. you know, and then he realized like, oh, this isn't, this guy was actually coming to try to make himself useful in, in an actually good way. <laughs> yes. And and this yeah. is one of the few people here who doesn't deserve to be manhandled. But again, this is the contradiction of the Thunder Five, right? Because in this one moment, you're absolutely right that he loses his cool and yanks a, a, a reverend out of his car. And then in the very next moment, once he is told he's a reverend, he says, Say, maybe I could come over and talk to you someday. I've been doing a lot of reading about first century Christianity lately. You know, Geza Vermes, John Dominic Croissan, Paula Fredrickson, stuff like that. I'd love to bounce some ideas off you. Uh-huh. Uh, that's uh-huh. that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it interesting? You know, I also I wanted to just reassure you, I don't recognize any of those names. Um, oh yeah, me, me neither. No. Oh, oh. Of we course. talk about we talk about Christianity a lot on the show. I have not studied first century Christianity at yeah. all. I mean, first first century Christianity it is a, f- a fascinating uh, uh, thing to think about, but I don't know anything about it. Um, I do wonder at this point if it's going to be relevant in some way because you know it's a story about religion, sort yeah. of. Yeah. I mean, as much as the talisman was, I guess there's there's religious undertones. Is really could what be. I mean. Could be. Yeah. And so from here, we're back with Jack and Dale reeling from the fisherman's message to them. I I like in this moment, though, the really important takeaway from this part of the story is that Jack has kind of stopped denying the truth at this point. Um, We see here the text says it's all coming back to him, that immense adventure, not because he wishes it, but because it has to come back. Forced outside forces outside of himself are picking him up by the scruff of his neck and carrying him forward forward into his own past the fisherman is proud of his handiwork yes the fisherman is deliberately taunting them a truth so obvious that none of the three men had to speak it aloud but really the fisherman is baiting only jack sawyer who alone has seen the territories and if that is true as it has to be then then the territories and all they contain are involved somehow in these wretched crimes and he has been thrust into a drama of enormous consequence he cannot possibly grasp right now so he's just kind of moved to acceptance mode, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think relatively soon after actually physically going to the territories, uh, he, yeah. he, he, had to, he had to switch over. It, it makes it very difficult to argue against the existence of a place once you have, have been there. Yeah, right. If I die and go to heaven, I'm probably going to say, yep, heaven's real. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, ha, huh, cool. <laughs> uh uh, so having gone through all of our major characters, now we we return to the point that we left them, which is the explosion of noise from the four stooges as they execute their Wendell led distraction plan. Um, the plan, though, I, this is really fascinating because the plan does work. Wendell is able to sneak into the, the building, get the pictures he needs. But as we talked about, 
Beezer is a very smart and very observant fellow, and he sees Wendell snapping some pictures, runs over there, approaches him, uh, rips the, the roll of film out of the camera, and uh, and and solves the problem. Uh huh. I mean, it's got to be a crime to ruin somebody's roll of yeah, film. Yeah, that's but, that's assault and destruction but, uh, of property for sure. But um, but yes, it solves the problem. Um, the specific problem, the one problem, and then probably creates a whole bunch more. But yeah, I mean, this is the main thing I was confused about. By the way, is like when this was happening relative to other things. But but it's fine. It doesn't matter. Now. It's at the very so it's after Henry has seen him. Mm-hmm. And done nothing, apparently. <laughs> not not told anyone. Yeah. To, to, to Henry's credit, like Henry spots him, quote unquote spots him, um, at the exact same moment that the four idiots rush out of the woods and start like making a mess for everyone. Yeah. So like he didn't the thing is he just didn't have the opportunity to like pull someone aside and be like, Hey, Wendell's over here. He just kind yeah. of silently observes him do everything he did. It all kind of sorts itself out. Yeah, it, it really just does kind, kind of sort of, itself out. Kind of weird, weirdly conveniently sorts itself out. <laughs> and, and, and I think you're absolutely right that, I mean, it is it is interesting to talk about this and we've been doing it a lot this week. The idea that it's kind of weird that this just kind of worked out for our characters. You know, like we introduce a conflict, we introduce a, a tension point, which is what if Wendell sees Jack do the thing that we talked about last week is the right thing to do but could get could get him in trouble what if wendell witnesses that oh no that's the worst possible thing that could happen oh no it happened and then the book goes yeah but don't worry about that (laughs) and and i think you're right that the thing it does leave is it leaves wendell with a personal vendetta and and he's a character who has no scruples who now has a specific vendetta against jack sawyer so while he cannot you know, take the evidence right now to City Hall and say, this man did the bad, take him away. He he now has motive and that could lead anywhere. And so we we get to play with that tension a little bit still. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you're totally right there. But I mean, it is kind of from like from a pure storytelling perspective. It's a little bit of a anticlimax where you're just like, huh? Oh, OK. You, you really you really laid the tracks for that and then and then just just pulled the brake of the train midway. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm I'm trying to think through like like we do want our characters to catch a break. And and I, I think sometimes, you know, there there are some writers who who aren't even bad writers, like they may be a really good writer, but like they get stuck in a mode where the the, the characters never catch a break. It's always just piling on always just making things worse and more complex and harder and and uh, i'm not even talking about like a miraculous youth catastrophe i'm just talking about like one positive break one stroke of good luck mm-hmm. um if you never get a stroke of good luck that's almost unrealistic in its own direction where, mm-hmm. where you're just like oh come on give me a fucking break um and so you could you could just simply view this as like hey sometimes characters are lucky you know or, yeah. or or you could go a different way and you could say, you know, Ka is actually watching over them or, or whatever. And, um, you know, they're going to get fucked over in some other way in, in, in 20 pages probably. But, <laughs> but, but here at least they, they caught a break. Um, sure. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm fully developed on this actually, but I, I, I do know that sometimes you want your characters to just catch a break. I, I agree with that. And I think one of the other things it does, we kind of touched on this last week a little bit with dale but it also reinforces again that while this is about jack sawyer and and we kind of just had jack's speech to himself where the 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 fisherman was taunting them but really he was taunting me specifically because i am the only one that can do this and while that might be true uh he needs the people around him right because the reason why he gets out of this is because of beezer because of henry in a in a smaller extent um yeah. he, he needs these people around him and the book is kind of demonstrating that to both him and us that's a good point yeah because he, he he's currently thinking of himself as you know the hero who needs to handle all this on his own yeah and, and that's probably a mistake mm-hmm. so the one clear result of wendell's plan though is that the state cops who by the way we haven't mentioned them before but just they're again with names their names are brown and black which are just the most standard ho-hum 
you know, like no offense yeah. to anyone in, in the audience whose name is brown and black and nothing against you personally. But like it's like they're designed. It's like I forget what their first names are, but if they're Bob, like Bob Brown and Bob, like I could totally believe that. Yeah. Um, but but they have seen enough mismanagement of this whole case and they step in and formally take the case away from poor Dale. Um, we're sad for Dale, of course, because this reflects poorly on him. But I, I do like Jack's reaction to this, right? Because he's sad for his friend, but he's not actually worried about the case being removed from their jurisdiction, right? Because he's recognized that a, this is dealing with some territory shit, some, some, uh, Seabrook Island shit. Right. And, and B, like we just talked about, he realizes that because of that, they're never going to solve it. So it doesn't matter who actually has the case formally because the way to solve this thing is not through detective work, traditional detective work. It's through some magic shit that I'm going to have to do. And so it doesn't actually matter to him who, who is leading the investigation. Yeah. 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 It's, you're, you're totally right. We, we just kind of sidestep the part of the story where Jack has to like fight for the case. Cause mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's just not, we're not going to do that. You know, he does, he doesn't really fit in a chain of command anyway. Um, so he's yeah. just going to do whatever he needs to do. So do you, do you like that? Um, and I'm not, this is not like a leading question or anything, but I'm just do you, like, there is, a, there is a version of the story that, 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 that is a much more central part of the story is the, is this the, the, the bureaucracy of trying to get a, a horrible murder like this solved. And then, and then the, the otherworldly stuff layered on top of it. It seems like we're just fully embracing the otherworldly stuff and moving away from the actual, you know, procedural detective work type stuff. Well, I'm, I usually don't particularly enjoy the kind of tension where it's, it's like, you know, give me a badge, you know, like, like I, I I don't, I don't like the, the whole, I don't always dislike it, but I I find that very often the idea that the detective is going to be taken off of the case is used as a kind of cheap way of just ratcheting up the tension one extra notch and and it and it's just kind of tropey and like okay i've seen it i've seen it like 10 times i'm not saying it can't be executed in a way (laughs) that's compelling and fresh um but but rarely rarely is that the case and so it's not like i'm like oh wow this is this is failing to be an adequate detective story because they're not super concerned about no it it doesn't it doesn't bother me I, i i think it's I think it's like um, it's of a slightly different tradition where it's not a police crime procedural. Now it's a, I mean, yeah, I think you mentioned maybe it was last week you mentioned um, Poirot, and actually, I don't, I don't know if he's a um, actual like, like if he's a private. It, Jack is effectively a private eye, right? He's mm-hmm. he's effectively doing the thing where he's like i'm you know I, i'm a one-man crime solving machine i'm just going to do this and and the private eye tradition of of uh of fiction is different from the uh, police detective procedural tradition that, that that's that's what i wanted to say there you go done yeah um you're you're very correct and, and you're right that um i think Poro was on the police force but he's most of the stories he's a private eye yeah okay um i mean some of the stories he's not even like a detective that's actually working a case he's just like oh i'm on the train and oh no there's murders yeah (laughs) guess i'll solve it right exactly Um, yeah which is kind of similar to jack because it's like i'm in the city and suddenly things are happening guess i gotta do that but of course i think king and straub get to play with that a little bit more because we know that in this world ka exists and and forces exist that are pulling characters towards things so i I think it's it's once again and i think we'll see this even more in the next chapter it's it's the universe conspiring to put these people in a position where they can do something about the problems that the universe has yeah yeah i like that you just implied that french landing is a train which makes it better obviously (laughs) Of course, because everyone knows trains are the best. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I love I love one of this thing. It, Jack is just kind of looking around, observing the scene, taking everything in. And he sees the mad Hungarian himself uh, look guilty and like kind of look away and look down and look guilty. And because he's a detective, he just kind of reasons that 
this is the guy. This is the reason why all these people came out here. The reason why the news broke is because of this guy. And he approaches him about it. He confronts him about it. And he basically gets him to confess. And I, I love the way that Jack deals with this, right? Because he could have just come to this conclusion and gone directly to the chief and said, like, look, Dale, I know who your leak was. It's this guy over here. Um, he just wanted you to know. But instead, he goes to Arnold and says, Arnold, I know it was you. You got to go tell Dale. And I think this is such a clever thing to do because I think allowing the person, the guilty party to come forward makes it so the chief will be like the maximally lenient on him, mm-hmm. which 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 I, I kind of want him to. Right. Like, I, obviously, the whole situation here was a fucking mess. And Arnold screwed up big time. He's a he's a bad he's a bad cop. He shouldn't be on the streets. He should be at dispatch. He should be the one behind the phone answering calls and then forwarding them on to other people. He should not. He should not be a beat cop at all. Mm. Um, but but like he just fucked up, man. It's and like he made the mistake of trusting his wife, which was a horrible decision. You should never do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally right, man. Um. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I I bet that Dale doesn't fire him. I, I, bet, I bet that I bet we don't see Dale fire him. I bet that, yeah. in fact, in fact, I almost predict some some massive you know hail mary save by by the Mad Hungarian in, in the final act of the story to to redeem himself. That's funny. Um, I mean, because there's two ways this could go, right? Uh-huh. Dale is lenient on him, and that pays off in a good way, or Dale is lenient on him and he fucks up again because yeah. he shouldn't be a cop. Right. Depends on what mood our authors are in, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still don't like if I were in Dale's position, I wouldn't feel like going so hard on, on, uh, on Arnold here because like the fisherman like called the cops and he gave a separate message to Jack. It's entirely possible that like unbeknownst to our characters, the fisherman also called some third random party that and th- that they knew would spread gossip in in the in the uh, town, um, j- just to make the situation worse. Now, you know, you and I have no reason to believe that as the reader. We didn't see that happen. It probably didn't. But from Dale's point of view, like he doesn't he doesn't know that it was he, he, even when even if the mad Hungarian tells him like, "Hey, I fucked up." He, he I, I I in Dale's position might just be like. Yeah, you you did, and you shouldn't have done that. But like, mm-hmm. I I think that this was just a fucked up situation, and and the secret was probably going to get out one way or the other, or 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 at least very well could have. Um, so this shouldn't be con- considered to be a career ending fumble, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. I like that. We'll we'll see how that plays out, but I think that's reasonable to to think. Okay. So from here, Jack heads over to where Wendell and Beezer are having it out. And this is um, this is the moment where Wendell tries to bribe blackmail and threaten Jack into helping him out. Uh, but none of it works. And instead, Jack just punches him in the stomach, which is our second <laughs> our second assault committed on right. Wendell in in as 20 minutes. Um, so, yep. yeah, I mean, like yeah. and this is kind of the end of that interaction, right? Yeah, the punching in the stomach is the thing where I'm like, ah, Jack, no, you've <laughs> you've now he already didn't like you, and now yeah. you've turned him into somebody who's really going to try to destroy you. Well, and Wendell seems like one of those people that would be like hyper litigious, yeah, who would just like immediately sue both the police department and Jack and mm-hmm. Beezer and everyone for the assault and destruction of property. And he would, yes, I'm going to press charges. I'm going to do all these things. He doesn't in this moment though. He just kind of sulks away, but that doesn't mean that's because he's a coward, right? That doesn't mean he's not going to circle back around and, and do it anyway. Yeah. I would almost rather he press charges than what I'm afraid he's going to do, which is like just follow Jack um and get pictures of him doing things that he shouldn't be doing you know like uh flipping over into another world yeah i mean (laughs) that would that would be interesting at least right that that, that, that would i mean yeah i I don't know that i'm very curious to see where we go with that sure yeah so the chapter ends with Henry and Jack driving away from the scene where Henry explaining to us what he heard this is kind of when he fills us in on you know the the conclusion of the beat where he discovers Wendell out there snapping a picture. And again, we already talked about this. Nothing really comes of it. Um, but but it does end actually with Henry saying, oh, Beezer St. Pierre, he seems like a really fascinating fellow. I'm going to 
I'm going to go over to his usual watering hole sometime and get to know these guys a little bit better, which is interesting, right? Because, you know, we had this, we didn't talk about it, but there was also this moment where Beezer and Jack like shook hands and he's like, if you need help with this investigation, I know you're not going to stop just because the Stadies have it now, but if you need help, you know who to call. So that's like establishing that relationship, establishing that me- that member of the Cotet kind of joining. And then we have this other moment where Henry and the, uh, is seemingly going to become friends with the, thunder five as well and that so that's another another link in our our chain of quartet happening here yeah absolutely and it's it's very cool to see mm-hmm so we move on to chapter 14, our final chapter of the week. This one kind of shifts uh, the book a little bit here. We move away from the uh, the Ed's Eats to specifically Jack's interaction with Judy and uh it's it's a really it's a really important chapter in this book matt there's a lot that happens here so let's just get into it right away because there's a lot to talk about for sure all right the first thing we have to talk about is a poppinaxis because <laughs> in the car on the way to the hospital fred and jack stop look out at this vista that judy always makes them stop at and says that he had a conversation with her this morning when he went and checked on her and the one thing she mentioned was she read the story about an apopanax in the the newspaper, the the, the same spelling bee story that Jack read, and uh, we, they have a conversation about this funny word. And Jack's here says Jack had found the word in his concise Oxford Oxford dictionary. Its literal meaning was unimportant. That's probably the definition of apopanax. Jack says a word not to be found in the dictionary, a fearful mystery. <laughs> so the book's basically telling us that when we like rushed to our computers to look up what the actual definition of this word was it's like it doesn't matter it's just a funny word that i thought sounded funny yeah yeah it it, it is it is a word but we're just using it as if it were a made-up word Mm -hmm. oh yeah okay (laughs) it's it's like the same as any other kingian uh midworldian word right just Uh like it's a it's a made-up word that we're going to repeat over and over again because king likes that repetition of made-up words but yeah the the actual meaning of it Well, well i mean i don't know sometimes i think Sometimes I think King like gestures towards, I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. And I was just like, you're lying. <laughs> you, it does. And you know, it does. That's why you picked the word. So I don't know. Like, I, like we already talked about how the, the Apopanax was a, a feather that appeared in the dark tower. So yeah. obviously he picked it for a reason. And maybe what he's gesturing at here is I'm only linking to the dark tower. Um, I'm not actually coming up with a, with a word. Although now that I think about it, that's Wolves of the Kala, and that hadn't been written yet. So mm. I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll this see. is this is what happens when you have to talk about the Dark Tower. You just confuse yourself. Yeah, as, as he intends, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we, we look at this beautiful vista as Fred is pulled over to the side of the road that Judy always makes them stop out every time they come out this way. Of course, it probably reminds her of the territories uh, for reasons we'll see a little bit later. But then he's got something that he needs to tell Jack about his wife before before he meets him. He says, OK, look, this is what you have to understand about Judy. She's a special person. All right. A lot of guys would say their wives are special, but Judy is special in a special way. First of all, she's sort of amazingly beautiful, but that's not even what I'm talking about. And she's tremendously brave, but that's not it either. It's like she's connected to something the rest of us can't even begin to understand. So I'm curious what your thoughts on on this particular passage. Um, I mean, he's probably just objectively correct that Judy is one of our special people with The Shining or, you know, and or some connection to the, the territories. Uh, I mean, we, we, we know that to be the case, honestly, but by the, by the end of the, the chapter, um, where, you know, the, the universe has blessed and cursed her with some measure of power and awareness of the grander scheme of things. Um, you know, she's, she's, uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna see that she seems very magical, um, in just a minute. I, I'm only, I guess at this point, my main curiosity is like, is she going to spend the whole rest of this book locked up? Or is she going to be more active? Because I, when we first met her, I really felt like she was going to be an active, um, um, you know, uh, character um, mm-hmm. in the story. And 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 uh, I don't quite see how that would happen with her locked up. I guess you know, if you can, if you can, if you can uh, put, if you can shift between worlds, then you can always break somebody out of prison if you need to. So, <laughs> sure, sure, um, yeah, I think that's a fair thought. I, yeah, we'll, we'll, we will see, but. Okay. Yeah, I think you're I think you're spot on there. Um, I think that's kind of what this is doing. I think there's a, a lot of parallels that are being drawn between 
Jack and Judy, um, mm-hmm. and as, as far as how they are perceived by other people. And I think that is one thing, if you remember from the talisman, people talked about Jack in very specific ways, you know, you know, mm-hmm. yes, he, he, he was beautiful. That's something that people talked about Jack all the time. He was, he was a beautiful kid, but, um, it was something more than that. It was a presence. It was a feeling that hit him and his heyday, like presented to people. And I think, you know, they still do. Like, I think that's why Dale was so enamored with him right away. You know, this, he, he has this, this presence, this connection to the world in a way that no one else does. So I think we're supposed to see parallels between these two characters for sure. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. I also, you, you know, you said you said Jack and Judy, and for some reason, uh, I was like, "Wait, Jack and Judy? Isn't that like a nursery rhyme or something?" Jack and You're Judy. About Jack and Jill. N- well, no, I'm. I know, I know, Jack and Jill is a thing, but I feel like, <laughs> and it's not, and it, it, maybe, maybe my brain was thinking Punch and Judy, but, 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 <laughs> but I don't know. It's just, I, I don't know. Judy and Jack both seem like, you know, they're both similar sounding names i guess well i mean matt jack and judy uh geller are the parents of of monica and ross geller from the tv show That's friends not what i was thinking about but yeah okay. but it was i mean it was 2001 friends is pretty popular you're right that's probably what stephen king was doing here <laughs> Sometimes doing this show is so fun because I can just say that's absolutely why she's named Judy and you uh-huh. can't tell me anything otherwise. That's how that's how reading works. Yep. So we get to the hospital, um, which is kind of horrifying at first, right? Like uh, from the outside, Jack describes the place as a 19th century madhouse in the north of England, dirty red brick walls with blackened buttresses and lancet arches, a peaked roof with a f- finale capped pinnacles, swollen turrets, miserly windows, and all of the long facades stippled black with ancient filth. You know, like it's this gothic, horrifying, monstrous hospital that like, I think you can close your eyes and, and see it perfectly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a great, uh, it's a great image. Great, great table setting. And then we meet the head nurse of Ward D, which is a woman named Jane Bond, um, which, of course, our characters immediately make jokes about. Right. Yeah. Jane Bond, double O zero. Um, I, I, what do you think of this? Because it's 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 almost like it, this just out of nowhere weirdness. Like, I don't I feel like sometimes Stephen King makes bad jokes and I feel like this is him just chuckling to himself. Like, <laughs> well, we'll name her Bond. I, I, I don't know. I feel like we are doing something with names in this book because, you know, I, I feel like in, in all the other Stephen King books we've read, the, the names would be, you know, John Simmons or just like, yeah, that's that's a name. Sure. Mm-hmm. Moving on. Right. Like, like you don't it doesn't it doesn't hold you up. But just this week, we talked about all the goofy ass names from, you know, the the, the idiot squad. Um, I, I think I think I think we've commented a few times that like such and such character had just like the perfectly apt name. And then here, Jane Bond is another name that just kind of holds you up and you're like, Oh, the name itself is just like a joke in text. In addition to just being something that you're going to notice the characters themselves notice it. So, I mean, is, is, is King chuckling to himself? Probably. But also I think in general, we're doing something different with names in this book than we do in, in other books. Sure. No, I think that's fair. That I I never thought about it that way. But uh, let's make sure we pay attention to that because there's there's, I mean, it's worth paying attention to. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots to say about this next conversation that's going to happen here. But I I wanted to, I wanted to pause on the 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 moments leading right up to Jack seeing Judy Marshall because we have this this right here. She seemed detached from everything around her. If her hair were washed, brushed, and combed, if she were conventionally dressed and had a suitcase beside her, she would look exactly like a woman on a bench at a train station, waiting for the hour of departure. So even before Jack sees Judy Marshall's face, before she speaks a single word, there is about her this sense of leave-taking, of journeys begun and begun again, this suggestion of travel, this hint of a possible elsewhere. I just love that writing, man. It's so it's so good. Yeah, and somehow it gives you a mental image, even though it's it's such an abstract thing to be visualizing. Yeah, and it really does. You know, we're we're two hundred and something pages into this book. I think close to three hundred actually at this point, and it really does make clear to you that you know 
this these last 300 pages have been table setting for the story really kicking into high gear and and this moment this this feeling of travel this feeling of going that this conversation is going to really rev up that engine yeah yeah i think you're right yeah so finally jack sees judy marshall and uh we were told that she was beautiful and she is absolutely beautiful in a way that completely staggers jack that's the line that the book used staggers and and again this is i want to say this is kind of how jack was was pointed out in the talisman we kind of talked about the moments where it was a little weird that these other boys that jack was around were just like fascinated by his beauty that he just had this presence um and and this is this is happening with judy here and 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 i've pulled way too many quotes of this section i don't want to spend the whole conversation reading but i just want to talk to you generally about the way king and straub describe her beauty because like you can't in a book just be like and her she was so beautiful like her angles, they were just all the best angles. <laughs> and oh, her, her, oh her man, it was just the right size, the proportions and the symmetry. Uh-huh. But and so what it does is it, I think it very cleverly like uses um, Jack's like very personal experiences. Like, you know, he kind of he kind of thinks about the other women that he was with. And, and it's just like they were nothing compared to this. They were beautiful California woman, blonde, beautiful but compared to this woman, they're trash. Um, and, it, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it just like, it just really sells, sells the point to you that Jack is just completely flabbergasted by the beauty of this woman who, who uh, will remind you is like, you know, in a, in a mental institution right now, wearing probably a, like a robe, no makeup has not combed her hair is just completely disheveled. And yet her beauty shines through all of that to him. Yeah, well, it seems like there's even something magical happening where he he kind of sees almost like her true right. her true form, um, and then he can also see how she quote unquote really looks. Mm-hmm. But but like you said, he the the true beauty underneath it shines through. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he fi- finds that he's immediately in love with this woman, um, which is not good because you know she's married <laughs> to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. I did find myself wondering if that's going to be like a recurring problem. Uh, you know, is he going to have to, is he going to be struggling with this as the story goes on? Um, I sure. mean, I mean, why introduce it if not, I guess is my first reaction there. Yeah. I think that's a fair, a fair assumption to have for sure. Um, we'll, we'll see if that goes anywhere, but yeah, he, he kind of is able to just like move, push it aside right now at least. Yeah, sure. So they begin talking and in their conversation, Judy is very frank, right? She, she kind of says, you know, I, this whole experience has reminded me that when I was a child, I would travel, not actually physically travel. She wouldn't leave, but she would just like travel in her mind to this place called the far away, a magical place that she describes that is basically, she describes it like the territories. We immediately recognize the territories, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And she reasons in this moment that, that whoever has taken her son, probably took him there she just knows for some reason um and i love jack's reaction to this matt i love the, i love this writing in this chapter so much what this woman has done astonishes jack at the worst moment of her life with her son lost and her sanity crumbling she used a monumental feat of memory to summon all of her strength and in effect accomplish a miracle she found within herself the capacity to travel from a locked ward she moved halfway out of this world and into another known only from childhood dreams nothing but the immense courage her husband had described could have enabled her to take this mysterious step so i mean the the astonishment of it of course is it is almost the exact opposite of the way jack has handled all of this stuff right Mm. then he has like for years pushed away all these things pushed away these memories pushed away these these experiences and not embrace them and here's this woman who goes through the worst thing a person could imagine which is having your your child be taken and, and possibly killed and and your reaction to that is to embrace these things that you had either intentionally or unintentionally locked away mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's that's true um I, I i'm i'm briefly distracted by the idea that like she's obviously a you know person with the shining or, or whatever mm-hmm. and 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 the fisherman has kind of identified her son as a, a, a person with the shining um i guess we kind of knew that there, that it was uh that it was something genetic or, or did we i don't know anyway it doesn't matter at all 
it's completely we, we actually don't know we don't yeah know. well it's 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 plausible that it that it might be and it's something that occurred to me which is sure. a tangent though um yeah yeah the totally right though that that like i think i think this is meant to contrast i mean i think jack himself is implicitly contrasting the way she handled this with the way he has handled this and, and mm -hmm. finding himself wanting actually yeah definitely but i think the most incredible thing to me is not judy's candidness in how she reveals that she can travel to the territories it's that jack is totally candid and honest because like it, 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 in front of fred by the way he fully tells judy about the territories and his experiences there and how he's gone there and the things he's done and it's just like it's very easy to remember that just a few short chapters ago he was so vehemently denying that this place even existed, that he refused to open his mailbox because he thought a bird's egg was going to be in there that might hint that this stuff is real, right? And it's just so fascinating to see that transformation that now, now all that is gone to the point where he's fine talking about this stuff in front of another person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's remarkable how honest he's being, particularly consider, considering that he's in an asylum right now and yeah, yeah. saying these things basically telling her that she's not crazy that everything that she believes in this moment is real and happened and you don't belong here at all because you're completely healthy yeah i think maybe just seeing how brave she's been has almost shamed him into being honest and, and brave in his turn I, I think you're right and yet the the it's interesting that the book does not like come right out and say that right it doesn't have jack consciously realize that but i, I do think you're 100 percent right there yeah, he just can't he he can't justify any more of of his weaseliness in the face <laughs> of of her, you know, her her beauty and and her honesty and just her sort yeah. of I mean, she so it's interesting he doesn't think this, but I kept thinking about you know, his mom during this scene because I mean, it's another it's it's a woman in the story who's, you know, very beautiful and has this connection to the territories, not the same kind of connection, but you know, she was the queen of the territories. Um and, and I'm wondering if on some level she's not also kind of reminding him of his mom. Yeah, that thought occurred to me as well. Um, I, I, I didn't want to overthink about it because he's like so got the hots for her. Yeah. But I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, a, a gunslinger <laughs> character had an Oedipal relationship with, with their mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's not going to be the last. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I just remember our initial reaction to that, which was like, what? What, what do we do with this? <laughs> yeah. huh. um, so speaking of of Jack being a, a, a full blown cup piece man now, I, I really do love this exchange where Judy asks Jack why he became a detective. Um, she says to him something you had to find for the sake of your own soul. Yes, Jack says her words have penetrated straight into the center of his being and tears spring to his eyes. I always wanted to find out what was missing. My whole life was about the search for the, a secret explanation. So this is great, Matt. Yeah. So l let me just lay this out for you in plain English here. Jack goes on this talisman adventure when he's 11 or 12, right? He is the singular important being who d accomplishes this great goal, saves the world, and more importantly, saves his mother. Then for, for some reason we don't fully understand yet, he allows himself to forget the events of of this time. Not only that, not only that allows himself to forget it, but he actively puts up a wall between him and those events, a thick wall that he doesn't want to hear through at all. He wants none of this coming through at all. And then he becomes a detective because on some subconscious level, he knows that there's a wall there and he wants to solve the mystery of what's behind it because he knows something is missing, even though he's the one that did this to himself yeah it's perfect I, 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 yeah it, it is i mean i love it and and i really hope that i really hope that we're not just chasing another um you know chocolate here by <laughs> by by thinking that this is going to be a mystery that's going to be resolved I, I i do feel like this is a central mystery is is why did he forget it in the first place and you know if the answer is just that's the rules. You got to forget it when you grow up. Then I guess I'll be a little bit disappointed, but not totally crushed. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we will definitely talk about this, but you know, before we get to the end of this book, I think there are things that the book has referenced broadly that could lead you to believe that there, that there's an explanation that mm -hmm. we might know. Um, I'm trying okay. to be very, trying to be very vague here, okay. but, um, 
no, I think I think it's definitely something we need to and we'll continue to talk about for sure. Cool. So Jack promises to do what he can to get to the far away and bring Tyler home. And then he and Fred leave. And there's this moment here as as Fred and Jack walk out of the hospital and into their car that you think, hey, this is going to be super awkward, right? Because you could you could see a reading of this where Fred is furious for like, you know, allowing Judy to have these delusions and to feeding into these delusions by telling her that they are correct. But Fred doesn't do that, right? He simply looks at Jack and says, did everything you say in there, was that, was that all the truth? And Jack says, yeah. And in more than says the, yeah, he opens a briefcase he brought and shows Fred Tyler's ball cap and says, I got this in the place that Judy was talking about. And then Fred is just on board, right? He just believes them now. He's just like, okay, got it. I'm in, go there, get my son. And I love you know, you look at a book and you, and you look where the lines of conflict are, right? And I think as an author, you're like, where do I want conflict and where do I not want conflict? As a reader, like, I didn't want there to be a conflict here, right? I just wanted this to be resolved. And I love that they just resolved it, that we don't have to have this fighting between Fred and, and Jack here about Judy and about what's real and what's not real, because we know it's real, right? We do. We don't need to, to spend pages and pages and pages on... It, Jack trying to convince Fred that all this stuff is real. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think Fred is unique in his own way too. Um, maybe that's what mm-hmm. drew him to Judy in the first place is, is this, sure. this openness and ability to be comfortable with and even love uh, the, the otherworldly parts of, of Judy and, and I guess Jack too. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I agree. Uh, glad we sidestepped the sort of tropey um, source of boring conflict. Sure. Sure. So as we end the chapter, we get these final lines far off to the west, a loose woolly smudge of pale gray blankets, the land besides the river. What's that? Jack asks. Rain? No. Fog, Fred says, coming in off the Mississippi. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. Fog. It's, the, it's ominous. Suddenly becomes the mist. It's the mist. The what, if, what if, what would you do Just, if... In the middle of all this stuff, all the setup and all this work, the mist comes in and now uh, there are monsters. It's like, oh, we okay. Just, we just forget about the serial killer plot entirely and they just have to survive. <laughs> and, then, and then it just ends with them escaping. And that's it. I kind of I kind of wish that happened because then I'd have to watch you like not. I, I don't think you'd like just fully dislike it, but I think you <laughs> would be struggling for good things to say about this turn. <laughs> And I would just like kind of enjoy watching you like shift uncomfortably in your seat, trying uh-huh. to come up with nice things to say about this random ass yeah. turn that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And then, and then you'd be like, yeah, this is the phase of, of Stephen King's career where he started just wildly changing what the book was about halfway through. <laughs> um, I really, I really love uh, this. It's my favorite thing about him as a writer. Oh, oh, re- re- oh yeah. Oh. Me, me too. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Cool. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that 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 does not happen, Matt. Okay. Um, That does not happen. I'm disappointed. (laughs) But that is it. That is it for these chapters. We are moving on to part three next week. We are going to be reading chapters 15 through 18. Uh, Matt, this is one of the longest sections of uh, our whole book. It's just the kind of the way everything everything fell out. Uh, I think this one's a 90 pager. So if you if you're reading, maybe set aside a little extra time this week to read those chapters because it's a little bit longer. All right, cool. But let's move on to our discussion question of the week. Matt, what was last week's question? Uh, What's your favorite uh, mystery slash detective fiction? Um, Or detective in fiction? Yeah. Any of the above. Yeah. And we have many answers as always. So first from Felidao. I read a few of the Dresden Files several months ago and really enjoyed them. The Dresden Files is a modern-day urban fantasy starring Harry Dresden, a Chicago-based private eye and magic-wielding wizard. The action sequences are fast, explosive, and engaging. The plotting is tight, and there's a lot of nifty world-building involving multiple vampire subtypes, creepy eldritch fairies, unholy hellspawn demons, and other similarly awesome things. It was a lot of fun. This uh, discussion question reminds me 
that I need to go back and finish the series, which I was well on my way to doing before all my spare time got rudely hijacked by some random Stephen King podcast I found on the internet. Yeah, those fucking losers club guys. I know. You really shouldn't <laughs> be, uh, you know, paying attention to any of any of that stuff. Um, I recommend uh, Pact if you um, if if you like uh, uh, urban fantasy. By the way, but I, yeah, I, haven't, but... I, I haven't ever read a, a Harry Dresden. Neither have I, and I've really wanted to. This has been on my list for a very, very long time, and I just haven't done it yet. Um, I think it's intimidating because there are so many of them. That's true. Yeah, that's it's the kind of thing where maybe I would read it if somebody just said like, just you know, read this one. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is the best one or whatever. And I, I don't know if they're the kind of thing that you can read them out of order. Um, I have no idea, honestly. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to, if you want to give us a, a hand there with maybe pointing out which of those would be the place to start, that might actually help. Yeah, I think from what I understand it, there there are some that are like later starting points where you like he wrote some of them where you could just start from this book and be fine. So okay. I, I don't know for sure, but yeah, readers of the Dresden files, let us know. Cool. Uh, Belwas deserves better says I am a big Agatha Christie fan. And while I love her cruel, Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple, my favorite Christie novel doesn't feature either of these astute observers of the human condition. Of course I speak of, and then there were none best to forget about the original title. Yeah. I, I think I remember what that original title is. In this novel, eight strangers from various walks of life arrive on a secluded island and have received mysterious invitations from one U.N. Owen. Unknown. Get it? (laughs) Very clever, Agatha. This party of eight are greeted by the butler and housekeeper, and shortly after dinner, a phonograph plays a recording accusing all ten of having committed murder in the past. Each chapter sees a guest killing... <clears throat> sees a guest killed and their numbers dwindle as the surviving guest becomes increasingly unhinged while attempting to figure out who amongst them is the killer. I won't spoil the 80 year old ending, but it's a doozy. Matt, how much Agatha Christie have you read? None. See, I've only read like two books. And and as a person who said you know, last week that I love detective slash mystery novels and stories, I, I'm really kind of ashamed of myself. Um, yeah, I guess I guess me too. I mean, I I, I don't <laughs> I've never really read any of the like classics of the genre. Um, mm-hmm. I think part of that is because I heard at some point that like, uh, for example, if you go back and read Sherlock Holmes, uh, uh, it it just isn't good in the sense that we think of like a good detective story, and and it's like it's because it was so early that like the the genre, the genre tropes weren't there because it wasn't even a genre, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so like, you know, if I have, if this isn't, I guess I'm sort of defending myself here, but mainly <laughs> just sort of explaining, like I haven't really felt compelled to read the older books, the, the older stories, because I feel like, um, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the genre has moved on. I don't know. I, I maybe, maybe I need to give Agatha Christie a, a chance though. I mean, she's good. Like I, yeah. I, I've recently read death on the Nile. Um, and I enjoyed it. I mean, it's, I definitely would not call it like my favorite mystery story, but, um, it's kind of light, fun reading and I liked it. I, this is one that I've always wanted to read and I haven't, so I did not read and then there were none, but I mean, just being reminded of the premise, it sounds something I very much enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, sorry. Next for just stand eight, four, six, zero says, my favorite detective stories include someone who is excellent in some almost superhuman way, but also has a cross to bear, so to speak. This might be a disability or trauma. We like to see them as the tortured genius. We get the sense that they couldn't possibly do anything else but detective work. I feel that Jack fits that definition well. To list a few honorable mentions, I will echo uh, Bellwis deserves better and say Hercule Poirot and his inimitably compulsive charms which all seem to pay off either comedically uh, or for the ultimate solving of the case but let's not discount the great mouse detective my early childhood intro to sherlock holmes and his obsessions with the minutest of details finally there is peter sellers in the pink panther he may not be much success in his in his detective work but i laugh every time i see him play his stradivarius or watch him fall off the parallel bars and tumble down the stairs um the Great Mouse Detective is one of those actually great movies um, that uh, 
people don't recognize enough. Uh, I don't understand how that movie got made because it, it's so good. Yeah. But it's terrifying also. It's super um, scary. It's it's great. Yeah. It's, it's one fun. of those it's one of those eighties cartoons that like somehow they got they got out there without anyone noticing that everyone like gets wasted and there's murder and <laughs> yeah right because <laughs> the, the the censors were just like oh it's a cartoon it's fine right. yeah yeah the 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 drunk the drunk mouse smelled <laughs> off to the to the crime boss so the crime boss fed him to a cat <laughs> and it's hilarious and yeah. yeah uh we have to do an episode on the pink panther at some point point. Sure. you need to watch the first pink panther movie let's do it yeah all right, Walking Dude 22 says, I am not a great detective, so I don't enjoy trying to solve a mystery. So when it comes to my favorite detective tales, I enjoy watching the detective figure out how more than the who. Of course, there is Sherlock Holmes, who is the archetype of the modern detective. One of my favorite Holmesian detectives is Adrian Monk from the TV series Monk. Mr. Monk is agoraphobic, incredibly observant, and intuitive. Tony Shalhoub plays the character with the perfect balance of quirks and charm. You can see how the character is struggling with his own nature while solving the mystery of the week. In the typical episode, we, the audience, know who the killer is, but it is endlessly fun watching Adrian Monk put the pieces together. These five-minute mysteries carry the show forward on a weekly basis while our detective tries to solve the only case that truly matters to him over the course of the series, the murder of his wife. Uh, Monk is one of the greatest detective shows ever made. It's mm -hmm. so good. Yeah, I love Monk. I I don't know if I've watched every episode of Monk. That probably isn't true, but um, I've definitely watched a lot of Monk. I've watched every episode of Monk multiple times. This wow. was back in the day where uh, there wasn't enough TV, so I watched <laughs> a lot of TV over and over again now, unlike now where I have 7,000 <laughs> TV shows I'm watching all at once. Wow. What a... Yeah, remember back when there was like there was like one thing that everybody would watch? Yeah, it was wow. wild. All right, uh, Emperor Fry the Solid says true detective season one all day baby not so much for the mystery compelling enough but the character building and tension between the two detectives who are very different and both hate and need each other i'd call both of them perfectly flawed which is impression impressive in fiction dang it now i have to watch it again matt just don't show your kids <laughs> yeah, have you seen true detective no no wow that's, that's one of the many things where i'm uh, where where i'm convinced that i would love it if i watched it you would 100%. But I haven't yet. So. Yeah, you would like 100%. Yeah. All right. Um, next, we have Baby Can You Digger Sam, who says there are so many good detective stories and detectives that it's impossible to pick just one. And since I've already talked about my love of Twin Peaks in other posts, I'm going to take a slightly more obscure route and mention 1988's Lady in White. This film creeped the hell out of me as a kid. It's a classic murder mystery with supernatural tones and uses many stalwart Stephen King conventions. A small town rocked by horrible crime. A young and likable young boy as the protagonist. In this case, Lucas Haas. And ghosts! It does an excellent job balancing the juxtaposition of mundane small town life in contrast with the existence of ghosts and the reality that one of their neighbors is a murderer. There's an incredibly shocking moment in the film, at least shocking to me at the time with my limited world experience, that still resonates with me today. A very underrated and underappreciated film. And apparently underseen, because I've never seen Lady in White. I've never seen it. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think I've ever heard of it. Um, okay. You've heard of it, though, uh, right? Um, no, actually. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Let me look it up. Maybe I've heard of it and just forgot the title. Yeah, no, I haven't heard of it. But I have heard of, of the honorable mention um, that they add at the end, uh, Who Framed <laughs> Roger Rabbit, a masterpiece of cartoon noir. I agree. Yeah, yes. uh, masterpiece is the right word for that film. Yeah. We, we did a whole doof cast on Who Framed Roger Rabbit just because I was like, Scott, I have to, I have to talk about Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I just just have to talk about it. Yeah, and it was so good. It was. It's that movie always gets me, man. Just, mm -hmm. just gets me. It Love holds it. up. If you haven't seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit in a while, see it. And Matt, I have something you need to see. Uh huh. You need to watch the Chip and Dale movie. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? I'm a dead serious. So it. The reason I'm talking about this is because it is also another movie where cartoon and uh, live action are mixed, like in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, it's written by the Lonely Island guys and directed by Akiva Schaefer, who's one of those three guys. Mm -hmm. So like if you liked pop star, never stop, never stop, never stopping or any of those type of humor, it's it's just absurdist, ridiculous thing mixed in this fun 
detective mystery story. It's a, it's a lot of fun, man. It's really funny. I, I'm being 100% serious that this is actually a good movie. I don't know who it's for because, okay, I do know who it's for. It's me. It's it's kids who watched Rescue Rangers in the 90s and played the video game on Nintendo because like all the humor is meant for us. So like I don't know why Disney made this movie because I just feel like if you watch this with your kids, they're just going to be like, I don't. I don't get it, but it's uh, it's good. Okay, well, that that now I'm curious to see how my kids react to something like that. Yeah, I would, I would, I would be really curious about that too because yeah. I don't. I'm gonna predict they don't like it. Okay, all right, fair enough. All right, so next we have from Pear Jane. Procedurals are my TV comfort food, and to the surprise of no one, I especially love procedurals with a supernatural angle. Lucifer, Angel, and even Sherlock Holmes spinoffs like Elementary and Psych feature superhuman powers of observation. I could pick any of those, or any ton of French novel, but I am recommending the British version of Life on Mars, featuring the incomparable John Sim in the lead role of British detective, of a British detective whose coma sends him spiraling back in time to the 1970s. It's a brilliant conceit. We get all the grimy, tough guy, car chase glamour of the 70s cop shows, Seen through the eyes of a 21st century protagonist who serves mango with his chicken and suggests that the brilliant w- woman on staff should be promoted to investigator. Meanwhile, we're all wondering, is this all a coma-based fever dream? Did he actually travel in time? Will his actions affect the future? Or is it all imaginary? It's available on BritBox and Prime, and I can't recommend it enough. It makes excellent rainy weekend binging. That's another thing I've never heard of, but I'm really interested in. Yeah, I watched. I check that out. I watched. I think the American version of it. Um, the less said, the better. <laughs> That's usually the case. I mean, it wasn't a nightmare. The way it ended was was absolutely just. Basically, they had to rush the ending because it was canceled. And it was, of course, it's bad. All right. Next, we have Quirky Beans, who says, "Well, you asked for it. My favorite detective story is Matt. Sometimes he's so." <laughs> so wrong but sometimes he's so so right i am here for it i've been reading king stories for forever so as a constant reader know where they are going to go it's nice to go back into that new reader perspective and watch matt suffer with the confusion of the unknown we love to hear those cogs turn and we can't forget scott he likes the books he's like the book's lawyer and he's so good at what he does he's always keeping matt on his toes leading him down different paths and trying to direct him elsewhere when he gets a little too close Shh, don't tell him i'm doing that no that's <laughs> It's compelling, it's funny, a little wacky, and they're both their own special brand of genius. I sure hope the show gets a season. Is this a discussion question or a review? <laughs> this is really nice, uh, really I think nice this discussion. Is, I think this is a response to us saying, why didn't anyone pick us for the cool people question last oh, week? That's that's very funny. No, that's very good, and, and thank you for the kind words. Yeah, uh, excessively kind. Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, all right, Complicated9519 says... My favorite detective story would have to be the Bill Hodges trilogy by Stephen King, or as I like to call it, the ever-expanding Holly Gibney stories. Anyway, I'm really hoping Matt reads these someday. I don't think I would, I would have read the the, the s- s- trilogy when I did if it wasn't for The Outsider. The Bill Hodges trilogy starts off with Mr. Mercedes and is about a retired detective who gets antagonized into trying to solve an un- unclosed case about a mass murderer who killed and injured a bunch of people with a Mercedes. Uh, The stories definitely have a slow buildup with everything inching closer and closer to the final peak. Just like Roland says, and I'll probably misquote him here, hours of setup only for a minute of shooting. But my God, does that minute feel amazing. The third book, End of Watch, has a ton of pink in it for Matt to dissect. I recently (laughs) read the stories again, and all I could think of uh, every time there was pink was what Matt would have to say about it. Um, oh Matt! Oh Matt! So making, much pink, making me sound like some kind of pervert here. But uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> to be fair, I'm just gonna have to read these books for all this pink. Damn it! No, I, I really like the Bill Hodges trilogy. Um, yeah, if we do a season three, I'm trying to think of. I, mean, I, I certainly don't think we would do all three of them. Um, I don't know. Oh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> You've got his wheels turning. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Co Donahoe eighty nine who says, 
As a few of my favorites are already taken, I'll go with the Jack Taylor series by Ken Brune. Taking place in Galway, Ireland, the series follows an alcoholic and drug-addicted private eye, or finder, as he prefers to call himself in the first book, The Guards. After all, there are no private eyes in Ireland. The Irish wouldn't wear it. The concept brushes perilously close to the hated informer. You can get away with almost anything except telling. I binge read the series and gobbled them down as fast as I could when they arrived on my doorstep. I found the first person point of view style interesting since we spend most of our time inside Jack's bedraggled mind. The series is almost written as a complete stream of consciousness, though there are, of course, times when our protagonists hero is most definitely not the word I would use to describe Jack is not conscious, suspenseful, witty, sometimes charming, heartbreaking, depressing, and on the rare occasion, joyful. This series certainly took me on a roller coaster of emotions, hmm. man, another detective mystery story that takes place in ireland this is for me i need to read these right away yeah yeah for, for some reason this is just the best sub splinter of the genre everybody knows that irish detective stories are the best ones ireland is just such a great fantastical fantasy realm it's true um all right cerebral dystopia says well i guess this would be considered an unconventional answer but it's more of a uh, comic book movie or character, if you prefer. Uh, but my favorite detective is Batman. Yes, the various forms of media where we encounter Batman lead more toward the action genre because he's always beating people up. But he is the world's greatest detective, is he not? When there's a mystery to solve, clearly the GCPD can deal with most of it. But there's a huge friggin' light on the top of headquarters to summon the Batman when the mystery is too great. And GCPD needs a better detective. Batman utilizes the meticulous nature, uh, uses his meticulous nature to identify the most subtle of clues and his genius level intellect to always remain three steps ahead of everybody around him. There's no mystery he cannot solve. And when he is on the case, no crime ever goes unpunished. Would you say that there's uh, no case too big, no case too small? Mm -hmm. When you need help, just call. Just call. Ch -ch -ch Chip and Dale. Chip and Dale. Rescue Rangers. Ba no, Batman. Batman. No, that's. Oh. An, I don't think that's an unconventional answer. I think that's a great answer. Yeah. It's it, it, although as I was reading that I was imagining like being like a detective in the Gotham Police Department and and having <laughs> having <laughs> Commissioner Gordon just come over to your desk and be like I'm picking <laughs> you off the the Johnson case. No, you're not oh, you're not God. you're not doing this to me, boss. Boss, boss, not please. Not again. Not again. That Damn could it. be a villain origin story right there. Yeah a, yeah. a GCD murder police that's sick and tired of having all his cases taken by the Batman. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, and, and, and like starts getting anxiety because they're like, I have to close this case in like a week or, 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 you know, <laughs> Batman's almost, you know, Batman's going to have the Joker back in jail and then he's yeah. going to, and then he's going to be on this case. It's like so, watching the sun setting. It's like, shit, shit, shit. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. my God. This is amazing. This is great. This is a great idea. Um, it's my, it's my best idea ever. Um, okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, next, we have Bricks, who says, outside of Holly Gibney, who I won't go into detail about, since I'm holding out that you tackle the Mr. Mercedes verse of books. <sighs> so much pressure um i have to bring benoit blanc from the amazing knives out instead it might be more of a pastiche of classic detective stories but the humor the twists and turns and the amazing cast of characters what an amazing movie uh yeah that's a great movie it is a pastiche of detective stories while also just being a really solid detective story it's still like it's that's that's the remarkable thing about that that movie yeah it's a fun performance uh, that, that's the daniel craig character right correct yeah that's just a fun performance yeah it's so good and we're gonna see lots of him because netflix wants ryan johnson to make seven thousand of these movies and oh. he's doing it good good for them all right the amazing duck 42 says growing up i loved nancy drew i recall her being whip smart and always two steps ahead of the bad guy solving mysteries and spotting clues that the average guy never saw i liked how she was always calm cool and collected and didn't need a man even though she had one and was perfectly fine on her own, not a damsel in distress. She was aspirational for me, and, I thought, a great role model. Granted, I'm a little wary that my memories of her stories are rose-tinted, since I haven't read any of those books since I was 10 years old, and I have no actual knowledge if they hold up. They're probably horribly racist, uh, but I don't want to look up to confirm. The dangers of books written <laughs> in the 1930s. Yeah, I God, the Hardy Boys gotta be racist, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. I read the Hardy Boys, I read Encyclopedia Brown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um I never actually read Nancy Drew, but uh, I didn't read Nancy Drew because, you know, yeah. I'm a child of the 80s and those were the girl ones. Yeah, so the girl we ones. didn't. Yeah. 
Yeah. The boy, the the boy Hardy Boys had the blue blue cover books. And yeah. Nancy Drew was with the that girly yellow color. Yeah. So yeah. we she weren't allowed to read those. She wasn't eating a hearty breakfast and getting off to solve the case. She was yeah. presumably eating some other kind of breakfast that I'm just not interested <laughs> in. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> some other kind of breakfast. Oh my god. No, I'm sure I'm sure the Nancy Drew books are are good i watched the nancy drew movie they made a movie i mean they made a lot of movies but they made a movie recently and i watched it for some reason huh. oh is i it? didn't know about that no was it 2007 <laughs> fuck me recently, recently. <laughs> fuck me <laughs> that's depressing uh, uh, that's always good okay Next, we have Sigma who says, I never really got into detective stuff and mystery can be so malleable. So I guess Persona 4, it centers around a group of teens in rural Japan whose town is haunted by a grisly serial killer whose victims end up sprawled on telephone wires. Would you believe me if I said it was the sappiest, most upbeat game in the series? Yes, because I've played those games and I know they're they're very dark. There is a detective character in it named Nato Shirogane, and she she does help you catch the killer. I didn't have access to the game at the time. I got into Persona and later into its parent se- series, Megami Tensai. So I just watched the anime adaptation, one of like two good adaptations of video games. I remember gasping when towards the end, she speaks with a protagonist to figure out who the killer is. Just the dawn of that realization, man, it ruled. Yeah, and that's some of the most fun about some versions of detective stories, right? That that the reveal moment, if if it's one of those ones that, you don't know who the killer is is such a fun fun thing yeah that's cool um just, yeah i mean without knowing anything knowing anything about this specifically I, I agree that in general some of those you know i can think of some movies where the, that that reveal has been just a you know gets an audible gasp out of you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all right uh shortstop 88 says what can i say other than a donut hole is a donut's hole and we must look a little closer and when, when we do we see that the donut hole has a hole at its center it is not a donut hole, but a smaller donut with its own hole. Uh, Benoit Blanc is a detective that I love. Everyone, sorry, everything from his excellent observation skills to his foghorn leghorn drawl to his good nature and even to his goofiness. I love every part of this character played by Daniel Craig in Knives Out. While many Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot types are great, but Benoit Blanc is a great new a nice new addition to the gentleman sleuth archetype. He was a nice change of pace for a detective character, which fit well with Knives Out's change of pace for a whodunit story. To best wrap it up, I cry every time I hear him say, "You are a good nurse." Such See, a good I, movie. Oh, I wish I'd read the whole quote with a foghorn leghorn accent. But <laughs> when is Knives Out two coming out? I gotta know. I, I don't know. <gasps> oh my god! It says this year. I don't. Is this true? I don't believe I don't, this. I don't know. They, I think we're past the time when they just make up release dates, though. I think that was a 2020, 2021 thing. So The film is scheduled to be released in late 2022, expected to debut at a film festival. Just just, just, just one. Yeah, one of them, you know. Just a, yeah. You know just, how it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Michelle Y says, I've already sung the praises of Straub's mystery and detective Tom Passmore, a twitter of Jack. Today, I want to discuss my favorite general mystery writer, Minette Walters. Unlike most mystery writers, Walters forgoes the series with its star detective. Each book is a standalone, a solid and fair puzzle rooted in character beats at the heart. You will be guessing to the bitter end. I will recommend The Breaker. Walters works her way through various mystery slash crime subgenres, cozy, amateur detective, locked room, etc. The Breaker is a police procedural set on the dorset coast in southwest england the body of a young woman is found on an isolated beach what happened why was her young child found wandering the road 20 miles away just when you think you have it figured out some new evidence changes the whole thing oh man i'm writing this down i gotta read this book this sounds fucking fantastic yeah it's, it sounds very it sounds like it has everything i like about um about uh tana french's mysteries where yeah you know or just in general the, the i like that phrasing like like every new piece of information you learn seems to like totally turn everything around um that's yeah. fun let me just reiterate again this week um and if you take anything from this two-hour episode where we talked about a book be it that you should be reading tana french if you like mystery novels yeah yeah i i agree i agree 
definitely. I mean, I, I, I more than agree. I think, I think it's fair to say that she is my favorite actually, or, you know, as a writer, mm -hmm. as a writer of mysteries. Yeah. Um, specifically. All right. Uh, last one. Steve L says the hard Caesar books by Dan Simmons were good, but it's been a long time since I read them. Darwin's blade was great. A guy f figuring out the weird and stupid ways people have died. Interesting. Um, but my favorite would be Bronze Tale in the Hyperion series. Crazy how this story is so interconnected and carries through all four books. Yeah, I mean, we, we've read, uh, I know um, that's the one that's like a noir detective. Yeah, that, he's the detective. Yeah. 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 yeah um, that, that's a fun one. Yeah. Yes, uh, we got to read more Hyperion. And I think I think we're gonna because we're on a Dan Simmons kick now because we enjoyed the terror so much. We did. I'm surprised nobody said Angus McDonald, Void Detective. Yeah, apparently, I, I I think the audience of this particular podcast skews a little bit older, so I don't know how many people listen to the Adventures. Yeah, Zone, maybe maybe they're not as big nerds as we are. That it can't be true. I refuse to accept it. Okay, I'm probably right. All right, that is all of our answers to last week's question. Thank you, everyone, for sending those in. That was such a delight, and I have like six more things I have to read now, so thank you for that. Matt, what is next week's question? Uh, favorite character names. So yeah, we talked about some some very fun character names, some very fun Stephen King uh, meaningful character names this week. So what uh, what are your favorite character names? Uh, anywhere like yeah. any, the sky's the limit just can, yeah can because they're funny can because they're awesome can because can they're, because they're metaphorically yeah, fitting right they're yeah. just yeah any reason all right folks that is it for us here this week next week as we said part three of the black house titled knight's plutonian shore begins with chapters 15 through 18 matt what is your real-time immediate reaction to hearing the name of part three well it's a reference to the raven Damn you. Which I knew off the top of my head. And I That's didn't impressive. Look up. Well, oh, wait, you're lying. No, no, you're I'm, lying. No, no, I'm not. It's because of the Simpsons. And I can remember the, the Halloween episode where the voice is. Um, I forget what exactly is being compared to the Knights Plutonian Shore. Is it the Raven's eyes? No, I don't, I don't know. No, that. I don't think it is. Ah, oh, shit. If, if I had a minute, I could I could go through the poem and I could remember where that line falls. Actually, you're just ruining all the notes that I had planned for next week's episode right here at the end just just for fun and i know that there's a raven so that's it <laughs> so we will be reading chapters 15 through 18 and talking about them next week yeah remember you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on twitter at kingslingerspod and the subreddit r slash doof media is a great place to hang out and also answer the discussion question that is correct and if you are not already subscribed to kingslingers you got to do it now, folks. You you got to do it. There's no excuses. There's no there's no delaying it. You you just you just gotta you just gotta so so do it. Yeah, absolutely. If you like any of our shows and you want to support them, then please consider donating to our Patreon account at Patreon.com/slash/doofmedia. Uh, this week, special thanks to Alex F and Catherine H. Welcome to the club. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy all the copious amounts of bonus content that you'll be getting as a member of this exclusive organization that's right so exclusive <laughs> uh, of course if you cannot afford to donate right now that is absolutely okay you can and always will be able to help us out just by telling other people that you listen to this podcast anyone all of them like sometimes i you know drive by uh, the crossing guard that is the, the, when I drop my kid off and I'm uh -huh. just like, hey, Kingslingers, uh -huh. check it out. Uh -huh. So why aren't you doing that? Yeah. You got to be real committed, folks. It's true. And, and of course, you can always leave us a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from Mike C77, who gives us five stars and says, old friends, 
I, like Scott, have read pretty much everything Cy King has written, and I am so glad I found this podcast. You two are like most of these books, old friends that I am so happy to see again. Rereading Through the the Eyes of the Dragon had me almost in tears of joy, and now starting to read Black House again after so many years has made me again wet-eyed and happy. Matt, I'm so looking forward to hearing your reaction to this book after having just read The Great Adventure That Is the Talisman. Do not lose hope and do not fear. The beginning may be slow, but by now you should have faith in our friend, Mr. King. All those that do not like this book are only one thing wrong. (laughs) So stay the course and get ready for the ride. And don't even think more so about burning or not reading Cujo. It's another must read. Thank you for all you guys do. This constant reader is thankful for your work and is now definitely a constant listener. Awesome. That is so nice. Thank you so much. Don't worry. Matt's not burning Cujo and is probably going to read it. And now I don't know if you saw the news, Matt, but King announced on the Losers Club podcast because he went on another podcast that wasn't ours. So I'm not bitter about it all. No. Um, it's funny because like we haven't asked. Like that's no. Why did he go on those shows? Because they asked him. Uh-huh. Um, but anyway, he announced that the book he's working on right now is a sequel to Cujo. So that's very exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. It's probably he probably heard that we were going to burn Cujo, and then um, he's like, "Oh my god, I got to write this sequel." I better. And then in in the like two or three weeks since we said that, he wrote the sequel to Cujo. I mean, any other author, I'd say, nah, that can't be. But uh, this is Stephen King we're talking about yeah, here, right? So thank you so much, Mike. We appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who continues to send in those rating and reviews. Like we said, it really does help. Honestly, it really does. As long as as long as the Apple podcast algorithm continues to to support reviews as it as an indicator of quality, which I guess that makes sense. (laughs) Um, They are going to be really important to us. So we appreciate you all taking the time and we appreciate all the nice things you say. It really does mean the world to me. Um, yeah. We got we got a very nice Reddit message today from a listener and and man that sure was nice. Yeah. That was nice. So thank you everyone who says nice things about us. You don't have to. We're not telling you you have to, but we do appreciate that. We do. All right folks, that is it for us this week. We will see you right back here next week for more Black House and I guess we're going to have to talk about the Raven. <laughs> <laughs> Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs> <laughs>